Okay. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janabala Bhangirivaradhari Jaya Gopi Janabala Bhangirivaradhari Yashoda Nandana Prajajana Randana Yashoda Nandana Prajajana Randana Yamuna Tiravana Chari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Mr. Bhad Paramahansa, Parudika Charja Ashtotar, the Shri Srimad, the Divine Grace, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai. It's going to be Bhitti Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa, Parudika Charja Ashtotar, the Shri Srimad, His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Ki Jai, Ananda Koti Vaishnavindi Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Sama Veda Bhakta Vrinda Jai, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to Sri Guru and Goranga. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. On this third day of July 2019 in San Diego, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is translation and commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. We are in Chapter 5, Karma Yoga, Action in Krishna Consciousness. Text number three, page 232. And we ask if you're not put it on the floor. Just put it on the yeah. And also, that iPad of yours is very holy also. Don't put it on the floor. <laughs> okay, page 232. I'll wait. Okay. Page 232. Okay, we're all set. Geya Sanitya Sanyasi Yona Dveshti Nakankshiti Nirdvandvo Himahabaho Sukumbandhat Pramuchiti Geya Sanitya Sanyasi Yona Dveshti Nakankshiti Nirdvandvo Himahabaho Sukambandhat Pramuchiti Geya Sanitya Sanyasi Yona Dveshti Nakankshiti Nirdvandvo Himahabaho 
सुखम बंधात पमुच्चते ये यस नित्य सन्यासी यो न द्वेष न खांक्षति द्वन्द्वो हि महाबाहो सुखम बंधात प्रमुच्चते कह रहे हैं ये कह गैयस सनित्य सन्यासी यो न द्वेष दिन खांक्षति निर्वंदो हि महाबाहो सुखम बंधात प्रमुच्चते ओके आई रीड द वर्ड बाय वर्ड्स गैया शुड बी नोन सहा ही नित्य ऑलवेज सन्यासी विनाउंसर Ya who na never dveshti abhors na nor kangshti desires nirdhvanvaha free from all dualities. He certainly mahabaho I am almighty armed one. Sukham happily bandhat from bondage pamuchite is completely liberated. Translation: One who neither hates nor desires the fruits of his activities is known to be always renounced. Such a person, free from all dualities, easily overcomes material bondage and is completely liberated, Almighty Armed Arjun. Purport. One who is fully in Krishna consciousness is always a renouncer because he feels neither hatred nor desire for the results of his actions. Such a renouncer, dedicated to the transcendental loving service of the Lord, is fully qualified in knowledge because he knows his constitutional position in relationship with Krishna. He knows fully well that Krishna is the whole and that he is part and parcel of Krishna. Such knowledge is perfect because it is qualitatively and quantitatively correct. The concept of oneness with Krishna is incorrect because the part cannot be equal to the whole. Knowledge that one is one in quality yet different in quantity is correct. Transcendental knowledge leading one to become full in himself having nothing to aspire to or lament over. There is no duali duality in his mind, because whatever he does, he does for Krishna. Being thus freed from the platform of dualities, he is liberated, even in this material world. Om jnana timadandrasya jnanandana shalakaya Chakshu un militam me na tasmai shri gurave namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance, but my spiritual master should have power but opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisances unto him and all members of Sri Parampara. So, um, this chapter began with Arjun's question uh, concerning sannyas and karma. Now, sannyas. Uh, means several things. The most common meaning is that it's, it's a stage of life. The, traditionally, in the Vedic culture, uh, uh, a male would go through different stages. Uh, in, in childhood, he would be trained in a school known as a gurukul, and then he would enter into household life and be married and have children and uh, do that thing. But being trained as a, 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 in a guru call, a spirit, he'd get spiritual training, which means that he understands that uh, there are different stages and that, that his grahasta life, his household life is the stage in that and he's leading toward uh, renounced life because the overall goal of human life is understood, which is to become free from bondage to birth, death, old age, and disease. The, the underlying assumption here is that, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, is that the first lesson, which it begins in chapter 2, is that we're spirit, not matter. We're spirit souls. We are uh, uh, irreducible, if you say, you know, quanta of consciousness, little particles of consciousness. With Krishna is the supreme consciousness, similar to the sun and the sun rays. The, su the sun ray also has a little bit of light, a little bit of heat. It's a qualitatively one with the sun but vastly different in quantity. So in our in ordinary consciousness, material consciousness, we have no idea 
that we're spiritual beings. We relate completely to our body and its extensions as the, the measure of our identity. Who, who am I? Okay, I have a certain age, I have a certain gender. Oh, please, take, give her a seat. You take one. <laughs> and we can also share a book. Yeah, we have many. We're on page uh, 232. So everyone is thinking, oh, I'm born in a certain family, I speak a certain language, I have a certain nationality, uh, I have a certain age. All of these things pertain to the body. And it's the first lesson in Bhagavad Gita is that that body of yours is always changing. And it's not your only body. You have, you've had many others in previous life, and you'll have a future after you leave this one. And even in this lifetime, you have many bodies. Meaning that we were all children. Every one of us was six years old at one time, right? And we can, some of us, still remember some of that. We had, certainly had a different body. We had a different mind, right? So the external body was certainly different, and so was the internal body, what we call the subtle body, mind and intelligence. And as we move through life, we gradually have different bodies. As Krishna says at the beginning of his teachings, the, this, the third verse that he chants, that he imparts, Dehi no smin, yata dehe, komaram yobanangjara, tata dehantara prapti, dhiras tatra namuyati. That uh, as the soul, the, the, con the conscious being, continually passes, even in this body, from childhood to youth to middle age, old age, similarly the soul will get another body when this body finally breaks down. And one who is dira, who understands the reality of these, such things, is not disturbed by such a change. Now, in the context of Krishna speaking that, he's saying, Arjun, you should not be disturbed at those who will die on this battlefield, even at your own hand, knowing that it's just like giving up, a, a, up an old coat and taking on a new one. Nobody dies. I made up a little ditty you can remember. Every body dies, you see? Every space, body dies, you have to see. Every body dies, nobody dies. Wake up, wake up, and open your eyes. You're not that body, you're a pure spirit soul. Chant the holy name and attain life's goal. <laughs> and we'll get back to that. But the first part is based on a verse by Bhagavad, in Bhagavad Gita in the second chapter. I think we may have to close the door. There's, sometimes when they get some, they were looking for somebody, they keep going round and round in, on the beach. It's happened before. That's better, thank you. I think we have so the, the, the Krishna says exactly that. Under all these bodies, he's referring to, except his own, uh, Arjuna's body and all the soldiers, everybody, as antavanta, it comes to an end. The word anta in Sanskrit means end. It all, they all come to an end. But nitya syokta sharirina, the sharirina, the dweller within the body, the soul, the embodied soul, is nitya, never comes to an end. Then what happens? Goes to another body. So this process of transmigration has been going on since time immemorial, since creation. And the, the, the basic goal of Vedic culture is to end that process. Stop this transmigration, which is fraught with suffering. What are the sufferings? The basic four. From this point, we're all alive. And so we're going to face, probably, old age, disease, and death, and rebirth. And that is going on, and it's called Janma Mrityu Jaravyadi, birth, old age, disease, and death. And in not just the human body, but everybody faces that. And there's another category of sufferings called the Adhyatmak, Adhibhautak, and Adhidaivak. And these overlap with the birth, old age, disease, and death. So Adhyatmak, we've all, we, all know, we all know what these are, we just don't know, may not know the name. Adhyatmak means bodies that are uh, sufferings that are caused by our own body or our own mind. Now, you can see they overlap with the others, but, you, but everything may be fine. Like the other day, what was it yesterday, I think, we had one of these super idyllic, you know, San Diego uh, uh, days, weather. Not as cloud in the sky, temperature 72 to 73, you know. Here we are on the beach. Oh, I've made it. I'm living in Pacific Beach. It's perfect weather. I'm in good health, you know. So there's no, there's no, uh, this, the, there's no adidaivic misery. I mean, there's no uh, um, rain. There's no extreme cold, extreme heat. This is called adidaivic. It's ca caused by the devas. You know, what the insurance companies say, well, it's an act of God. Sorry, we don't cover that. Right? You're in the airplane. 
a thunderbolt hits, sorry, you're not covered. <laughs> Adi Daivik. <laughs> and then the other is Adi Baltic, which we're completely familiar with. We may not familiar with the name. Miseries caused by others, by other living beings, mostly, let's face it, other human beings. But it can be, as Prabhupada says, bed bugs, it can be the insects. So you, you, you get bit by an insect, by a mosquito, so that's a misery. And then, if you're in Africa or somewhere, India, you can get malaria. Yeah. So now you have an adiatmic misery, whereas you have the adiabatic misery from the mos mosquito bite, but that's nothing compared to the adiatmic misery that comes. As a, so you see, there's always one of these or more that are threatening us or that we're suffering from now. Right now, we, we may all you know, feel pretty good, but um, who knows? An earthquake could happen right in the middle of the class. Adi Daivik. You know, and then suddenly we got to run out, you know, and be careful, and maybe the roof's going to fall. <laughs> I mean, these are happening all the time. And or we have our dear leader, who's causing adiabatic misery for practically everybody in the world, because there's so much anxiety. What's going to happen next? Is a war going to come? You know, uh, is my social security going to be cut off? <laughs> right? That's adiabatic miseries. So these. <laughs> These are happening or threatening or, or we're suffering from them. And then there's the big four, which everyone has to go through, old age, disease, and death, and rebirth. So that's what this world is. Krishna, Krishna certifies in the eighth chapter that this world is dukalia mashasvatam. Dukalia means an abode of suffering. And even if you say, okay, I'll tolerate, it's cool, you know, I, I, I can do it. It's, it's temporary. That's another suffering in and, all, in and of itself. Even if you get used to your situation and I'm okay, I'm doing okay, I know I got it. But still, it's going to change radically. Just like if you live in an apartment, okay, and it may not be the most uh, gorgeous apartment, but somehow I can afford the rent and we're going okay. No, they can raise the rent or they can sell the building and, and, and demolish it. You have to leave, they're going to build a big high rise or something. You have to move. That itself is painful. Moving is almost like dying sometimes. So what I'm getting at is that that's the, that's the first lesson in the Bhagavad Gita, is that this is not our real life. This is not all there is, you, you know, life in this material world, fraught with all of these sufferings and temporariness and everything. There is another life based on pure spirit. Rather than a mixture of spirit and matter, which is what this world is, mostly it's dead matter, like we're surrounded by it. Even our bodies are basically dead, but they're animated because we're inside. The shock comes, most of us at this point in our life have experienced someone dying. Suddenly that person who, who you knew is no longer there, although the body is there. At that moment, we all get a kind of a realization that the body isn't the self, isn't it? You look at your father, your loved one, your child even, you know, oh, they're gone, you know, if you use that. Oh wait, the body is still there, so the body couldn't be what the, what the self is, you see? There's a little moment of enlightenment there. But then, you know, we're back to bodily consciousness. So Krishna consciousness begins with understanding our spiritual nature and then living a life based on that understanding and, and living on that transcendental platform. And then you can get to the point here, the dveshti and the kankshiti, meaning, meaning you, you don't hate things that happen to you and you're not enthralled with the, uh, the different varieties of things that are going on around you. You know it's all going to change. You are, you are at a different level. You're seeing the world for what it really is, a big uh, play of, of different energies. And you are simply watching it. You're going through it. And so the role is, that the perfection is, to use the energy that we have, uh, have control over. It, it may be minimal control, but it's some control, beginning with our own bodies, uh, in, to connect with the Supreme Soul. We, they were trying to connect with the Supreme Soul, who is known as Krishna, meaning all attractive. Isn't it a great relief to understand that that Supreme is not some disembodied energy, you know, that you have to merge with, so you have to destroy or dissolve your own personality in order to merge? That's like anathema for a, for a bhakta, for a devotee. No, the reality is that the Supreme is the Supreme Person, who has a personality, a form, activities, and in, in, in reality, they're all attractive. Anything that we find attractive in this world, beautiful form, fragrance, sounds, ideas, music, dance, you know, especially loving relationships, 
Krishna has it in perfection. If God isn't perfect in everything, then he's not God. So why wouldn't... Prabhupada said uh, very, very wisely that we can learn a lot about who God is by contemplating ourselves. Now, if, if you were God, you could do anything you want, you know? What would, what would we be? What would we do? Would we be like a multi, multi billionaire, you know, and set up in a big mansion somewhere, you know? Well, that might be part of it. But really, <laughs> it would be the perfection of relationships, wouldn't it? It would be that we, we're able to exchange unlimited loving relationships, meaning that we're loved back, you know, and a variety of activities. What, what, where do you find fun in this world? Well, you're going on a party. You know, dancing and singing and acting and making jokes and all of these different things. Why is that fun? Because there's a rasa there. It's not, it, you can't say, well, you know, why? Why do I like, uh, you know, why is the sky blue? You know, well, it's blue because, Prabhupada said, because Krishna likes that color. But the point is, it just is at a certain point. <laughs> and so the, 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 the supreme, powerful person, would not uh, try to take you know, the pleasure in, in, in just lording it over someone. That ultimately is, gets old really fast. You know? uh, rather, he would do what, what Krishna does, which would be at certain points to hide that majesty so you can enjoy intimate loving relationships, say with his mother. All right? we have, we, Prabhupada said the closest thing we have in this world to pure love is a mother's love for the child. Pure love means completely selfless is that you're simply happy seeing the loved one happy. Pleasure. That's pure love. And in most of the times, uh, can you make sure this door is closed? This, this closet door. You can hear it's like the airplane taking off in there. Uh, is that um, the mother is, the, the child is, is maybe even just a, you know, a few days old. Uh, hardly even knows the mother is a person. But just knows this is the source of all safety and warmth and nourishment and, you know, and if the mother can, can make the child happy, well-fed, healthy, she's happy. There's a happiness that doesn't depend on her own happiness. She's not expecting anything from the child other than that the child will be pleased. That's pure love, you see. Now, it, can, you, it can't be maintained. Ultimately, the child grows up, moves away, right? And, and the relationship becomes attenuated. I remember my, my own mother when I was... Uh, Back in the 80s, I, used to, I, I lived in Miami. I would fly up to New York. They had these cheap flights. Believe it or not, $69 round trip. The People's Airline, they called it. It didn't last very long. They went out of business. But while they were going, I would fly up there <laughs> and visit my mother. She was uh, in the 80s. She was uh, in her early 80s herself. And, and uh, you know, she, she, my father had passed away. He passed away, actually, in 87. So I continued to visit her. And uh, when I would go up there, she would you know, treat me pretty much like she always treated me. Are you eating okay? She just wanted to make sure I was fed, or, you know. And if, I, if I, was, I, was, I was happy and healthy, then that was good enough. Not for my father. My father, he wanted to know, when are you getting out of that thing? You know, he never understood about Hare Krishna. <laughs> I've been already 30 years at devotees, so when are you getting out of that <laughs> Because he's always thinking, you know, he's gonna, I'm going to be some success somewhere or something. It's a different relationship. But the mother basically is, if you're he happy and healthy, she's happy. And, you know. So that's, that's uh, Mother Yashoda. You know, she's the ideal. She's always worried that Krishna hides his majesty and his, and his uh, godship so that he can enjoy this loving exchange with his mother. And she, she is merged, it describes, when Krishna's growing up. God, God makes himself, you know, turns himself into a little child and grows up in uh, Vrindavan, in, you know, 5,000 years ago. So like any child at a certain point, you know, he gets mobile, right? I mean, that's a whole new level of anxiety for the mother, isn't it? No longer is he just tied to my skirts. Now I got to worry he's crawling here, crawling there, we're going to get into danger. And then when he starts to walk, oh my God. You know, he's going to run into the forest, he's going to get hurt by some animal, step on something, what's going to happen? So that anxiety for Krishna is the source of the greatest happiness. There's a, there's a bliss there. Krishna can't be hurt, he's God. But she thinks he can. And therefore he, he relishes her care. And then, you know, when he comes back and she's so relieved, she embraces him, you know, and milk flows from the breast, and tears are flowing and everything. So 
that, what were you saying? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, like that picture where he's returning home. It's a beautiful painting. It's almost like a Rembrandt or something, you know. And all the, all the Russes are there. The Gobies are there, you see, watching the friends. His friends, the, the, this one right here, the horizontal one. He's come back from the forest from playing and, and herding the cows. So the parental Ras is there, the friendship Ras, and the conjugal Ras, the Gobies are excited to see him again, you know. And uh, he even has his, uh, some servants there among the boys. So, so the, I, the point is, is that we, are, we belong in that, that, that uh, painting. We're somewhere in that painting. In other words, that's the reality. This world of so-called duality is just a, 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 a huge illusion. It's a play of what we call maya. Maya means that which isn't, that which is not. It seems to be real. How can you deny it? You know? And in one sense, it is real, but it's not what it seems. It's not what it seems. It seems permanent, but we know from experience it's not permanent. And that lack of permanence is one of the greatest sources of anxiety. That's why Krishna says, Dukalyam ashashvatam. Ashashvatam means it's not eternal. You cannot find a permanent place of peace and happiness in this world. Even if you get off of this plane, there's different planes of existence, higher planets, heavenly planets, where you live a lot longer. The weather is always perfect. You have a young body forever until you die, you know, and then there's old age stuff. And, and uh, you can live thousands and thousands of years there. But at a certain point, you, you still have to leave there. Krishna describes in the ninth chapter. So here, back to our verse. Uh, he says, who is really a, a renounced person? One who doesn't uh, hate anything in this world and doesn't desire anything. Near dvandva. Now dvandva means the dualities. Heat and cold, pleasure and pain. You see? But it also means seeing this world as d separate from the Lord, as independent. That's another meaning of, of dvandva, duality. And our whole problem uh, starts when we turn our back on Krishna, we turn our back on a relationship with God, and we try to be little gods ourselves with this material energy. We're given this world. Why does this world exist? Because we wanted it. It's just like, why do prisons exist? Because there's going to be a certain element that uh, breaks the law. Or why are there rehab units where people to, you know, try to get dried out or get, get off drugs or something? Because there are certain people who are going to get into drugs and they need something like that. So we need this world of duality to act out our uh, fantasies of being little gods. And, ho and hopefully, with the proper knowledge, we can understand why we keep failing. And we do keep failing. Even the so-called big guns of this world have so much money, so much power. Eventually, they also get old and die. Then what? We don't see what happens then. But they're not, you know, Rockefeller, one of the big Rockefellers passed away a couple of years ago. He's over 100 years old. I forget, I forget which one. But Rockefeller is a famous name from the oil, you know. And so he had power. He had, they was running this, uh, you know, one of these uh, think tanks that all the leaders come to and everything. So many plans for controlling the world. Doing this. And then what happens? The whole thing comes to nothing. When he leaves the body, the, rock, the, the body named Rockefeller goes to the grave. But the person who is in there, who takes all the karma with him, you don't know what happens. It's ended. The dream of being a little god is ended, you see. But when we are in our constitutional position, Prabhupada uses that phrase here, very important. Constitutional position means we're part and parcel of Krishna, eternal servants of Krishna in one of those rasas. And if we can live even in this, on this platform, in that relationship. That's why we have all of these services to do. You know, I mean, I'm doing a service here. You know, I'm not getting paid or anything. I'm reading from Prabhupada's book and trying to present the philosophy. It's a service. And then, you know, the, 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 uh, those who are on the altar right now, addressing the deities or doing puja, they're doing service. This, may, this whole temple is maintained by a little crew who keep it clean and maintain and so forth. And then we get so many nice donations to help pay, pay the, you know, keep the lights on and everything. So that's all service. That is our constitutional position. We don't do it. We shouldn't do it. Said, okay, I'm going to do this service, then I'll get this and I'll get that. You know, I'll get a better position in this world. That's, that's material. Although it may be, a, you know, a better than just gross uh, demonic uh, activity, which has no reference to the Vedas. But it's not bhakti. 
it doesn't, it doesn't reinstate you in that original relationship with Krishna. So, so here, Krishna is teaching us, Nitya Sanyasi, you want to be completely renounced? Because don't forget that what keeps us coming back here are these unfulfilled desires that we have, that we cultivate in each lifetime. We enter life, and there are all sorts of latent desires that develop as you grow up, as you get and, and you're moved, you move around in the material world. Uh, some of them have been coming from past lives, some of you are cultivating in this life. But it's a whole array, uh, or, or, or array of different uh, unfulfilled desires, and that's the positive side. Also, a bunch of fears, things that you, that, that you, you, know, you don't want to happen. That's the, that's the flip side of desire. So that's why I say nirdvandvo, right? No dualities. Dualities of, of, of uh, dveshti and kanshti. I hate this, I don't want to experience it. I gotta have this, I gotta, that's Kanshati. And Dvaishti says, no, whatever, I can't stand that. Let me get rid of that. Both of those mentalities need to be transcended so that as things happen, as they eventually will, you can tolerate with equanimity. And even when there are so, much, so many allurements to enjoy, separate from Krishna, you can tolerate. You, know, you have your center of Krishna consciousness that provides you uh, transcendental pleasure, and confidence and, and uh, uh, tolerance you can have. That's what he's saying here. And then one can live happily, sukham bandat pramuchiti, free from these bondage. The only possibility of being happy, happy in this world is experiencing transcendental pleasure and with the confidence and the hope that you'll break out of this material world entirely and go back to Godhead. That's, that, that's really the, the goal that we should all have. And uh, as a social uh, activity, we should try to give the knowledge and the practice to as many as possible. That was through the Papa's life. And that's, that's what all the, the, the teachers of Krishna consciousness do. When you have something that, that is so invaluable, you're experiencing it, and you, and you, you, you realize it, that this is, this is the real treasure. It's called prema dhana. Dhana is a word that means a treasure. And prema is love for God. That's the real value in this world. That's the goal of this whole process. And everything else follows. Liberation comes in its train, all the knowledge you need, you know. What, Krishna even provides what you need materially, you know, without your asking. You don't have to, have to exaggerate any, any material needs. You can live very simply. And, but, but with a wealth of realization in your heart. And the ideal is the Goswamis, great Goswamis, Srila Prabhupada was one, but they're called the six Goswamis. Some of them were extremely wealthy and influential. Right and in ha left hand of the king of the, of the country, Rupa and Sanatana Goswamis, great scholars and uh, exemplars in devotional service. They, they completely left their position. Rupa Goswami cashed out, if you will. He had a boatload full of gold. You can imagine how much that would be worth today. Billions, you know. So he, he, he divided it in, 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 uh, first in half, gave half of it to the uh, Brahmins and Vaishnavs, for their maintenance, gave a quarter of it to his family because they expect something, and then he had a quarter for emergencies, which turned out to be great because he was able to bribe a jailer to get his brother out, and he came and joined him, joined him in, uh, in Vrindavan. He didn't personally bribe him, but his brother you know, used that money to get out. So, and then what? Now they have no money left. So what do they have? Materially, they had nothing. Just try to, try to imagine. <laughs> you know, we feel sorry for these homeless people here. So they were homeless, but they were, we didn't have to feel sorry for them. They were voluntarily homeless. They were wandering around Vrindavan, which is the ideal spot to be in, because Krishna's his hometown. And they would live under a tree, not the same tree. They didn't make this is my tree, your tree. No, no, they just lived under a different tree each night, and, uh, which is pretty austere. Clothes, did they save any of their old robes and things from their, their uh, wealthy days? No. Rejected, you know, rags, basically, they covered themselves. How about food? You know, whatever they could beg, a little something. Once a day they ate, you know, a little plain rice, you know, something. All right, well, how about sleep? What left is sleeping. No, they hardly even slept. They lived one and a half hours, if that. Then what did they do? What was their state of consciousness? They were writing all the time. Rupa Goswami has left us the most extraordinary books that this movement is based on. And his brother also was writing. And they, they would attract you know, wealthy but pious merchants and things. And they would, they would donate and build temples. 
They, they themselves didn't build it. They just said, okay, you want to give some money to me? I don't need any money. But you build a temple. And you go to Vrindavan and you see, still see those beautiful temples that were built. And they would go around Vrindavan and with their transcendental vision and others who were living there, they said, oh, this is where Krishna performed this pastime. This is actually where he w walked the earth and performed the most uh, ex uh, attractive pastimes, Vrindavan. And so they would say, oh, this is Radhakun, this is Shamakun, this is where Krishna uh, did the rasa dance. And to this day, pilgrims go there from around India and around the world now, and they do, do, do parakram. They walk around and they remember just like, you know, if, if people who want to, want to relive the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, they'll go to the battlefields and there's memorials as oh, and they can visualize the battles taking place, you know. Well, that's mundane, but this is transcendental. Here is, here is where Krishna, you know, uh, ran from the gopis and whatever, you know, like that. And they, so this is with their contribution. Just doing that, writing the books especially, but the other things, they form the foundation of this movement, which is now f over 500 years later. So uh, they, they were the wealthiest, although externally they had practically nothing. So they were the ideal sannyasis, and they were sukham, what to speak of sukham, ananda, uh, f completely free from bondage. So we can, we can move toward that state, uh, you know, in, even in this very lifetime. And the most wonderful thing about Krishna consciousness is it's, it's a long-term project. Even if you, you don't complete the course in this lifetime, and we should, still you'll pick up in your next life. It's not so for anything material. You may become a big engineer or whatever in this life, but it's all gone in the next lifetime according to the different attachments and karma you performed. You may not be even a human being in the next life, what to speak of an engineer. But you just begin Krishna consciousness, you come to one Bhagavad Gita class, and you're sure to be a human being. So you already benefited. You didn't pay anything. You're all sitting in the class. Even this lady here, who maybe you're not hearing so much, she's benefiting tremendously. Hare Krishna. <laughs> give, give her a little poke. Hare Bo. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. Sorry. Are you okay? Okay. So, uh, any questions on this verse? We can go on to the next verse. Because it's all about Sankhya and Yoga. It means uh, an an analysis or active uh, service. Okay, let's go on to four. Sankhya Yoga, Patak Bala. Pravadanti napandita ekam apyastita samyag ubayor vindatepalam Only the ignorant speak of devotional service or karma yoga as being different from the analytical study of the material world, sankhya. Those who are actually learned say that, th that he who applies himself well to one of these paths achieves the results of both. Purport. The aim of the analytical study of the material world is to find the soul of existence. The soul of the material world is Vishnu, or the Supersoul. Devotional service to the Lord entails service to the Supersoul. One process is to find the root of the tree, and the other is to water the root. The real student of Sankhya philosophy finds the root of the material world, Vishnu, and then, in perfect knowledge, engages himself in the service of the Lord. Therefore, in essence, there is no difference between the two because the aim of both is Vishnu. Those who do not know the ultimate end say that the purposes of Sankhya and Karma Yoga are not the same, but one who is learned knows the unifying aim in these different processes. So, the central theme here is that uh, there's a danger in like uh, focusing in on one aspect of the Vedic processes and thinking that that's the goal. Just an, an analyzing, what would, what would an, an, uh, what's, what's the, say, a Sankhya um, uh, perspective in Krishna consciousness? Well, okay, what, what, what do we have around us? We have various energies. We have the solid matter. We have gas, gases. We have liquids. We have radiant energy, isn't it? And then more subtly you have space. So these are mentioned in the seventh chapter. Krishna says, these are my energies. They're material, but they're emanating from me. Boomer, apple, onano, vayu, kum. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. Or solid matters, etc., as I listed them. So we're, we're, we experience them every day. We don't even think about them. But that's, uh, that's Sankhya. Where, where, where do they come from? What are the categories of, of matter or reality around us? But it continues. 
That's the gross elements. But then there's the subtle elements. Mind, intelligence, discriminating power, and the most subtle of all, the sense of self called the ego or hankar. So Krishna goes on. Boomer, apple, on a kungmano, buddhir, evacha, ahankara, iti yam me binna prakatir ashtada. Ashtada means eight. These eight constitute my separated material energies. And he calls them upara, which means not transcendental, l lower energies. They're, they're not alive. There's no, they're not conscious. This little podium here is not conscious. Neither is the air or anything else. So that's, that's, that's Sankhya. But it goes on. He says, but above these, these two ver this is two verses in the, in the seventh chapter. Apade mitastranyam prakadim vidhime param jiva bhuta mahabaho yeye dam dharyate jagat. So this is the upara called prakriti. Prakriti is a word that means nature, uh, both material and spiritual. So he says, these, lower, these are the lower energies. They're still my energies. But above them is the para prakriti, the spirit, spiritual energy, which is us. We're indivisible. We don't merge with each other or with God. We're eternally anksha. Anksha means little particles. But we're superior to all of those material energies, including the mind and intelligence, even the subtle ones. And then he says, Everything in this world is a combination of these two energies. Now one may ask, well, what about like that chair over there? There's, there's no soul of the chair. How is it a combination of spirit and matter? Well, on the higher level, and this is part of the Vedic understanding, there are higher beings known as devas. There, there's Bhumi. Bhumi is a personality. The, the, the mother, mother nature you know, sometimes he takes different forms. He takes different form of a cow and approach Brahma. But there's a, there's a personality in charge of all of these energies. There's Vayu, in charge of the earth. Varuna, in charge of the waters. Surya, in charge of the sun, the heat and the light. So there's a personality behind all of them. We don't see how they're controlling these things, but they are ultimately controlling. So everything is a combination of spirit and matter, including ourselves. That's the first understanding. So this is Sankhya. But, it, but what it doesn't tell you is, well, what can I do to stay in that understanding and live in that understanding? And that's what, that's what those who just take one aspect, the Sankhya or the Karma Yoga, which is different activities, that's not so much understanding the analysis. But what, what, what Prabhupada is making the point here, following Krishna in his verse, is that they go together. The, the Bhakti Yoga means to analyze who I am, how I fit in this world, and then to use the, the, the different energies, we as the Spirit use the different energies, to connect to the Supreme Soul. That's the ultimate goal, that connection. And what's an example of it? Well, what about sound? Sound is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is one of those energies, and it's produced uh, by the, uh, the, the air, is an essential element of sound, right? Without, without air, there's no sound. So you have to have that element to produce sound. So the sound is, is a central part of what we experience in our lives all the time. But, and so that sound affects our consciousness. Everyone knows how music can affect your consciousness. But also the words that we hear and the word that we hear silently in our head when we read. This is all sound energy. So, so, so hearing sound that connects us to Krishna and producing such sound, this is one of the prime means of bhakti yoga, to reconnect with Krishna. And, he, and, and Krishna is so powerful, he can manifest himself through these energies, just like through the sound, so importantly, through the name, the holy name. But not just the name, Bhagavad Gita also. Why take this trouble to struggle through chanting these verses, you may ask yourself. <laughs> There's a certain power to the Sanskrit, even if you don't know the meaning. These are the words of Krishna. This is the, the supreme uh, language, is Sanskrit. The very word Sanskrit means perfectly composed. That's what the word means. So uh, Krishna is speaking here. This particular sound, when we understand the meaning, and also the, the holy name and so many other sounds, these purify the consciousness. Whereas other sounds will pollute the consciousness. Uh, to be honest with you, I never, I could never, I mean, I used to like, you know, folk music and rock music a little bit, you know, before, and I, under, I was especially like classical music. And, you, you know, it has an effect on you. It, it lifts you, whatever. whatever. Um, even though it's mundane, maybe a different mode. I could never understand uh, hip hop. You know, <laughs> there, there's not much music there. It's all the words, you know, and it's not, you know, 
Krishna Kata, that they're, they're chanting. But they have a certain effect on you. It may bring you in, down into a different mode of nature. We'll, de we'll deal with the modes later. But the point I'm making is that all of these elements and how they interact, that's what our environment is. Understanding that, then, and understanding the means taught by the Bhagavad Gita itself and by the representatives of the Gita such as Prabhupada, how to utilize this energy so that we uh, uh, get closer to Krishna and finally get out of the material energy. The example is given of um, taking out a thorn with another thorn. You know, I like to give the example. Some of you have heard this. I keep giving it. Uh, when I was a child, I lived in an apartment for, for many years, most 20, 20 years or so. Uh, and it had wooden floors. You know, I'd run around like any kid, you know. And periodically, I'd get a splinter from those wooden floors. So I soon learned uh, how to take that splinter out. I would ask my mother, can I borrow your sewing kit? Because she had a little, you know, this is, we didn't even have a sewing machine. She had a little sewing kit, you know, like <laughs> coming from the 50s and 60s now. And so I <laughs> said, sure. So she gave me, I knew where to look, you know, and there was a bunch of needles. I took one needle out and got down in there, you know, and just kind of dug for it in such a way that it didn't hurt. You know, I mean, if you... And gradually I'd get that splinter out and it would be out, put a Band-Aid on, and back. I was back running on, a, on the wooden floor again for a while until I got my next splinter. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's what we wa are meant to do with the material energy. The very material energy which is keeping us bound, we use it in such a way, the key is to know how to use it, to get free from the bondage of the material energy. You see? Uh, uh, or the example is if you, get, you drink too much milk, you can get you know, uh, indigestion. But if you take yogurt... Apparently, you know, a certain mixture of yogurt, that'll cure it. It's still milk, but it's transformed. It's under, you know, the, the wisdom of a doctor, you know, you can do it. So that's the idea. We're in this material world, that's all we got to work with. So we, we, so we use the material world in such a way, material energy, that we get free from the bondage of the material energy and reinstate it on a spiritual platform. Another example is the deity. It's carved from stone, this is carved from wood, we know that, you know. But because it's a certain form, because it's worshipped in a certain way, with certain mantras installed as a whole ceremony, Krishna agrees to uh, relate to us through this material energy of stone. And the Bajaris will tell you, and you know, it's, not, it's not just a, a statue. People come in here, what are you guys doing? You're working a statue. That's because they don't see. They don't <laughs> they're not purified. But we know we're, no, we're worshipping Krishna. You know, he's, he may come through that stone uh, form, but he can relate to us through any one of his energies. You know, so that's, uh, that's the science of bhakti. It's, tra it's, it's um, amazing. It's inconceivable with our present brain, but it actually works. Okay, um, any questions on this verse? We'll pick up on text 5 on Monday. This is a very interesting uh, chapter. It ends, Christian doesn't mention himself, as the object of worship to the very end of the chapter, last verse, last line of the last verse. But it's a really important verse. It's called the peace formula. And we'll, we'll get to it uh, in the end. And there's several verses talk about nirvana, Brahma nirvana in this chapter. So it's a very fascinating chapter. They're all fascinating in their own way. Okay, so we have three minutes. Time for a few poems. Because it's said that one should end on a very sweet note. So... Uh, Here's one of the, one of the verses. Uh, it's, uh, this is a verse by Madhavendra Puri, a great, a great uh, disciple of, uh, uh, in our line. He was the spiritual master of, Lord, of the devotee who took the role of Lord Chaitanya's spiritual master, Ishwar Puri. So, and he wrote this verse. It's quoted in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And it's a, it's a prayer. It says, uh, this is the Sanskrit. It says, Kama di nang katinda katita palita duni deshas. Tesham jata maina kadona natrapano pishanti Utsri jayatana di yodopate sampratam lamta buddhis Tvamayatak shadonam abayam mam di yung svatma dasye So shadonam abayam is a really important phrase. It means the, sh the shelter where there's complete fearlessness. We're looking for that. So this, Madhavanri takes the role of a conditioned soul. He's actually a great transcendentalist. He says, in how many ways have I sought to obey the seductive demands of my wicked desires? They've shown me no mercy, yet on I've gone shamelessly trying to quench lusts unquenchable fires. But now I'm rejecting these hellish desires, for my higher intelligence now has awoken. O Krishna, O shelter of fearlessness, 
Please let me serve you with faith that will never be broken. And here's one by Lord Chaitanya himself, who's Krishna himself in the role of his own devotees. This is a very famous verse. Uh, and we'll end here. Cheto dapana marjanam bhava mahada bhagni nirvapanam shreya kaida vachandrika vatadanam vidyavadhu jivanam anandam buddhivardhanam pratipadam purnam itaswadanam sarvatmasnapadam padam vijayate shri krishna sankirtanam. You ever heard this one before? Okay. <laughs> this is the first verse of the Shikshastaka. So it says, uh, all glories to the chanting of Sri Krishna's holy names, which easily extinguishes samsara's blazing flames by polishing the lust-encrusted mirror of the heart. That chanting is the waxing moon that knows the secret art of causing the white lotus of good fortune to unfurl its petals far and wide throughout this bleak and blighted world. Of transcendental knowledge, which will take us to life's goal, the chanting of the name of Krishna, is the life and soul. The ocean of ecstatic bliss floods far beyond its bounds, wherever Krishna's merciful and mystic name resounds. Indeed, whenever Krishna's names are sung in congregation, at every step one tastes a joy that knows no limitation. So here with great attention, as I earnestly request, please chant Sri Krishna's holy name and be supremely blessed. The soothing nectar of the name will bathe your consciousness, bestow pure love for Krishna, and eradicate distress. That's spoken by God himself in the form of Lord Chaitanya. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.